Hi, this is Dr. Jenny Byrne. Welcome to our CPCH wellness program. In this section, we're going to talk about internal sleep factors. So if you've looked at our module just before this, you'll see that we talked about external sleep factors, doing things that can help your sleep. So this begs the question, if you have controlled all of your external sleep factors and you're still having trouble with sleep, what is the next step? So here's where you want to consider possible internal sleep factors. So let's talk a moment about sleep. We did have a Sleep Basics uh, 101 uh, little mini course that you can go back and view. Um, sleep efficiency is the total time asleep divided by the total time in bed. And if you think about it, when you go to bed, normally it does take a little bit of time to fall asleep. Normally you don't fall asleep with, you know, instantaneously and wake up instantaneously. So 85% or higher for sleep efficiency is considered normal. If you have 100% sleep efficiency, so as soon as you get in bed, you're instantly asleep and you're instantly awake in the morning, that may mean that you're not getting enough hours of sleep. So that's kind of an interesting note. Um, it's actually not normal to have 100%. If you have 75% or lower sleep efficiency, that is typically some sort of insomnia. What about sleep duration? This is always a question, you know, how many hours of sleep do I need to get a night? So I put up this chart here because I think it's really interesting to show how the needs for sleep change with age. So in this chart, the dark blue is kind of considered the normal range, the recommended range for different ages. The lighter blue-green is what may be normal for some people. And then things in yellow are generally not recommended. So if you look at adulthood, you're typically uh, recommended to get seven to nine hours of sleep, although some people may do fine with six and some people may do well with 10 or 11. Um, so if you're getting, you know, five hours of sleep a night, that's probably not enough. And if you're sleeping 12 hours a night, that's probably a little too much. Why, um, why would you have insufficient sleep duration? Well, maybe you're going to bed too late. Maybe you're waking up too early, or maybe you're waking up in the middle of the night too much, or a combination. Um, this is important because um, if your sleep efficiency is off or your sleep duration is off, you can have insomnia. So let's talk about some of the different kinds of sleep disorders. This is not a complete list, but these are some of the ones I think are the most important to know about. We're going to talk about primary insomnia, hypersomnia, sleeping too much, obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, REM or rapid eye movement sleep disorders, and circadian rhythm disorders. What is primary insomnia? Primary insomnia is difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep or non-restorative sleep for at least one month. This is interesting because it has to happen for a month, right? So if you have a couple of nights where you're not sleeping well, that's kind of considered within the normal range. It really gets to be a problem when it's lasting for more than a month. It also has to cause significant distress or dysfunction during the day. So again, you might have a couple nights where you don't sleep great and you wake up and maybe you're not 100%, but you're not really significantly distressed or dysfunctional. Um, it also means that the sleep problems cannot be explained by another medical or psychiatric condition or substance use. So if you're not able to go to sleep at night because you have a medical problem, right, like maybe you just had surgery and you have pain and you're not sleeping because of the pain, that's not primary insomnia. It's still insomnia. It's just because of the pain from the surgery. So primary insomnia is when it's not explained by other reasons. Hypersomnia is basically sleeping too much. So there are some different issues here. You could have excessive daytime sleepiness, or EDS. Sometimes you can see hypersomnia with major depressive disorder, where you're depressed and sleeping too much during the day. Or narcolepsy is a kind of hypersomnia. And narcolepsy is when you have a sudden urge to sleep, sometimes very quickly in the middle of the day. And there's different kinds of narcolepsy. I'm not going to talk about all of them for this presentation, but narcolepsy is considered to be a type of hypersomnia. Obstructive sleep apnea, or OSA, 
is when you have complete or partial airway closure during sleep. So again, that could be in your throat, it could be in your nose and your sinus area. And these are people who maybe have loud snoring, you know, or waking up, jolting awake, choking in the middle of the night. Sometimes they're not aware of it, but if they have a partner in bed with them, then the partner will notice it. Um, sorry about that. Uh, there's an interesting relationship between obstructive sleep apnea and weight. If you are obese, it puts you at higher risk for having obstructive sleep apnea. And similarly, if you have obstructive sleep apnea, it is more likely for you to gain weight. So we're not sure exactly how that works. It's maybe a little bit of chicken in the egg. Um, however, if you have weight loss in people with OSA, it can improve their symptoms. Um, it doesn't necessarily get rid of them entirely, but can help. Sometimes you'll hear about treatments for obstructive sleep apnea, which are CPAPs or BiPAPs. That's basically a device that sometimes goes over your nose and mouth or just in your nose that gives you um, air pressure to keep that airway open. Restless leg syndrome is something you may have heard of. This is the urge to move the legs because of uncomfortable sensations. Some people describe them as like a twitching, a pins and needle, or just a restless feeling. Typically, this is relieved by getting up and moving around. It normally happens at rest or with an activity, so not just while you're sleeping, but if you're sitting for a long period of time as well. And it's often worse in the evening or night. So sometimes people have restless legs during the day, but it's not such a big issue because they can get up and move around. But at night when you're trying to rest and go to sleep and your legs are moving, that's when it's really distressing to people. REM sleep disorder. So REM is rapid eye movement. Most people know that as the time when you're dreaming. Uh, REM sleep behavior disorder it has some features of dreaming uh, where you, uh, your muscles, um, you act out dreams. So your muscles are awake, but your body is asleep. And you can have involuntary body movements that pose a risk of injury for you or others in the bed. A different type of REM sleep disorder, sleep paralysis which is the feeling of being conscious but unable to move. Typically, if this happens, it's in the morning when you're waking up. So you, in other words, your brain is waking up first and your body is still asleep. It's taking longer for it to wake up. Uh, there's also nightmare disorder where you're having frequent nightmares. This is different than the nightmares from post-traumatic stress disorder, which are a different type of nightmare problem. Circadian rhythm disorders. Now, again, if you want to review what a circadian rhythm looks like, you can go back to that Sleep Basics mini course. Uh, we talk more about uh, circadian rhythms there. But you can have problems with your circadian rhythm where you're not on that normal 24-hour cycle that tells your body when it's time to be awake and when it's time to be asleep. So you could have a delayed sleep-wake phase. This is when you're two hours delayed. So let's say you're trying to go to bed at 10, but your body isn't ready until 12. This is really common in childhood and adult ADHD. And this is someone who's a night owl, right? Their body and their mind is very awake um, for longer than other people's. And they tend to sleep in later in the morning. You can have the opposite, which is advanced sleep-wake phase. That would be someone who wants to go to bed at 10, but their body wants to go to bed at eight. So it's kind of the opposite problem. You can have an irregular sleep-wake rhythm where it just doesn't follow a regular cycle. You can have a non-24-hour sleep-wake rhythm. So your body's circadian rhythm is maybe 28 hours or 30 hours or 18 hours. It doesn't really follow the norm. Uh, shift work, if you work the night shift, that can be very confusing to the body's sleep-wake system. Or jet lag is a really common example when you're traveling to a different time zone. It takes your body a while to catch up to the rhythm of that new time zone. So I hope this has been helpful. There's some great resources if you'd like to learn more. The American Academy of Sleep Medicine has some really good information. The Sleep Education Consortium, I think, has some good stuff as well. And then the Center for Environmental Therapeutics, that website talks a lot about light and dark therapy for insomnia. So um, you can learn more about kind of circadian rhythms and, and how light and dark therapy can help. So I hope this has been helpful, and I'll look forward to speaking with you soon.